So the program was started by a, some inspiration. It, it was with our song leader, leader Sister Jennifer Tanan. And then, uh, well, the address is true. And it will be followed by an intimate year to the heart of God and glory be to the Father, who's already sang, and the opening song also. And uh, invocation for our speaker. And followed by tithes and offering, as well as operatory prayer to be uh, given to us with Sister Jesus Romero. And then followed by a scripture reading, as well as pastoral prayer by uh, Elder Rosalito Dalman. Then followed by a special song, because uh, they are our special visitor this morning, so they will uh, give us the special song also. Then followed by a message in words by Pastor Roly Obedencio and closing song to be given to us by our song leader, and then the benediction from our speaker. And the hymn of consecration, we have this hope. Song leader, Sister Jennifer Patagna, presider yours truly, and our deaconess sister, Australia Dalman. Happy Sabbath and good morning. July 18, 2020, Popsicle in the Fire. The evening of Monday, December 17, 2018, saw the second burst fire in the history of Manaus, a city of 2.1 million located in the heart of the northern Brazilian Amazon rainforest. About 600 houses in a very poor neighborhood were destroyed, leaving 2,500 people without shelter or personal belongings. On the evening of the next day, local Adventist churches in Andra had already served 300 meals and even 500 basic food baskets, clothes, beddings, shoes, and other necessities to those who had lost everything. While many residents stood in line to receive help from the church or government for their basic needs, one Haitan popsicle seller thrilled the relief team said Fernando Anversa Borges, one of the other workers, even though most of Haitians living in Brazil struggled to survive as refugees after an earthquake ravaged their country in 2010, these men decided to sacrifice walking up the line of the survivors. He gave away all the popsicles remaining in his box, which were his only source of income a small act with a huge import. As a modern representative of the poor widow, this man was moved to help others, giving all that God had placed in his hand. Our appeal, whether we live in a poverty of affluence, we do need to experience some loss before being able to sympathize with those who are suffering. Or do we instead allow the Holy Spirit to change our heart, giving us empathy and true love? Are we ready to imitate Christ, sacrificing all, even our lives, for the redemption and well-being of others? Of course, our tithes and offerings do not represent all the popsicles in our box, but they are a token of our desire to help others, feeding with spiritual food those who have been ravaged by the fire of sin. As we partner with Him in this holy work, we may be sure that He will provide for us. In Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10, there is nothing to fear. Our deaconess is ready to get our tithes and offerings.
grace and love, using what you gave us to bring spiritual nourishment to those who need to know you through us. Amen. for our uh, scripture reading uh, can be found in John chapter 4 verses 21 to 24 I'm sorry yes okay uh, Jesus said unto her woman believe me the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at the Jerus at, at Jerusalem worship the Father 22 you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, where the true worshippers shall worship the Father in Holy Spirit, in spirit and in truth. For the Father speaketh, seeketh such to worship him. 24. God is spirit, and he that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's now down for a word of prayer.
Thank you very much, kids, for the song. I believe it's your offering to God. 
Whatever we do in the Sabbath day, especially here, is our offering to Him. It may not be perfect in the eyes of God, but it is, I mean, in the eyes of men, but it is beautiful in the eyes of God. Amen. 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 And because of that, we don't need to worry about how we sing, how we look, how we do. As long as we do our best, there is time to improve. As long as we live. And in the sight of God, God looks at our heart. It's so beautiful to Him. Let me encourage the kids, keep trying, keep trying until you develop to such a level. Actually, it took me a long time to practice singing with my mom, my, my dad when we were kids with my brother. And we had this party before. But then, it's not always perfect. There are some times that I would, our boys would really go somewhere else beyond, you know, <laughs> the tune or the accompaniment. But it's okay until such time. Uh, I had this music in college. I had this music lesson in college. And uh, we were, Mountain View College, we were taught, we were trained how to do beating, you know, four, four, okay, all, all that kind of sort of to read notes. And I was a member of choir of uh, Mountain View College. But for how many years I didn't use it until such time when I was in Bangkok. I was a member of the choir again. I didn't use it until such time I get contracted with the disease here. I lost my voice. I had a hard time teaching. And when it returned, it must be a bacteria. And when it returned, it was not the usual thing. And I couldn't read high octave anymore. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is wrong as one of the strings is broken? And I couldn't believe that my voice would go somewhere else. And like, this is not what I, I hear. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanted to say, but in my mind is correct, but what is coming out of my mouth is different. The good thing is we serve a God who is very understanding. And so, despite I've been singing for a long time, I, could, I would just choose, if I am asked to sing a solo, I would just choose the low voice because my voice has changed through the years already. However, part we are rendering to God, I believe we do it for God's glory. And so, just for today, I am delighted. I'm happy that after three months, actually, how many, when was the last time I was here at Sopanbury Church? Uh, yeah. I believe ago. two years ago, right? <laughs> two years ago. Or yes. even, uh, even uh, ACTS, I was at I ACTS, they, but, but, but in this yeah. area here, three that was ago. four years ago, I think. Three years yeah. or four years. Three. Yeah, just right before the wedding of uh, Ruthie. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah? yes, yes. I think that's a right before, before that one, or maybe after. We came here with Pastor Reb and uh, introduced them. Okay, that was uh, okay. four years ago, three years ago. Three years ah, ago. during his uh, installation, right? Yes. Uh, that was three years ago, right? But say small only, yeah. it's small. not the big one. Okay, <laughs> so it's been that time, maybe about three years. It's been a go, right? Long time ago, and so I could see here some fruits, some new faces we will be knowing each other in the afternoon. And uh, all right, um, I am glad that uh, although I'm not installed yet by the mission, we somehow, this kind of mutual acceptance already because you're not new to me, I'm not new to you. And so yeah, perhaps I don't need that installation because we know each other uh, generally by reputation even we met here in person. Now, uh, have, we have here some native speakers of Thai and English, and so let me just use their language so all of us can, can relate. Oh, I can use Visayan, uh, not much of Tagalog, although we use at home. My Tagalog is so Baroque, and my Visaya is a bit changed already. You know, language in the pocket is different than the one conversational. Now, this is easier for us for a long time already been using here in Thailand. And, uh, being an ESL teacher for 16 years in three countries. It seems like it is usual for us to use this international language as our medium of communication this morning. Now, our lesson this week is so interesting because it talks about in Matthew 4.19 that Jesus said, follow me in easy English. Actually, 
Be my disciples, learn from me, and I will teach you how to catch people. Right? And in your translation, you see there, follow me and I will make you fishers. You mean fishermen. Fishers of men. Literally, fishers of people. It means catchers of people. It means networker of people. It means introducer of people. It means soul winner. In other words, a true Christian by definition in that passage is a soul winner, a networker for Christ, an introducer, an influencer, a catcher of people, however you like to use that term. We are dealing with people. And whenever we would like to shirk responsibility, I am a Christian, but I don't like to approach people, we defeat the purpose of becoming a disciple. Agree? And what did you just say, Pastor? I would like to go to heaven, but I cannot approach anybody. I'm so shy. That's why Jesus follow after me. He said, follow after me. Learn from me. For my yoga is easy and my body is light. All right? In other words, believers or Christians or disciples should be the best people in the world in approaching people. We should be experts in winning souls. We should be experts in introducing someone to Jesus. We should be experts in networking people for Christ. Not work, networking people for money. We should be expert in relationship, in aspects of interpersonal relationship. Because Jesus said so. Learn from him. Learn from me. And that is the way we will be learning this morning. Now I am purposely doing this on screen because as we have agreed with four other churches, I'm assigned now as a new district pastor. Now no church is left behind. And so after this, our other churches, the three of them, are going to catch up what this sermon is all about. Because this will be a series for one quarter. Let me allow me to keep preaching for the whole quarter giving seminar so that everything will be pieced together and we will be in one page. I, I believe you know what I mean, right? When we are not in one page and you are in page 50, I'm in page 1, or maybe I'm in page 200, you're in page 20. We will have some problems later on. So to, to flatten the curve, if it is COVID-19, to, to sort out all those perceived problems later on, let us actually be in the same page by having the same mind, the same thinking, the same understanding, so we will not have complications, right? When I say this word, you exactly mean what I, I mean by this. Not that when I say this word, you have a different thinking. And so this morning, it's wonderful. Out of this lesson, this is, this, there is very special approach that Jesus did. More complicated than any one of them there except one. This is very complicated approach. And I believe when we learn this one, we will know how exactly how to approach someone, not exactly like PhD level of approaching, at least to some degree. And I believe you're watching here online, you, you can learn from this one because the principles in here are applicable not just in disciple making, also applicable in your classroom, in your occupation, in your interpersonal relationship, in your business, in anything that involves people. Because eternal principles are applicable to all people at all times. Imagine, that is what I mean by principles. Policies, rules, they keep on changing from time to time. But principles, they keep on applying, being applied, applicable at all times. And so, now let us go back to what was read by our brother, uh, Elder Dong, Dudong, in John 4, right? And so, let me rather give this example. How did Jesus win a Samaritan. And our study is long in John 4, 1 to 30, but when, when we understand it, it is so wonderful, full of truth, full of principles, and we can see ourselves where we are. Because I've been emphasizing from the beginning that once you are a Christian, you should be an influencer. You cannot be quiet. You cannot say, I'm so shy, I cannot do that. If we want to have crowns in heaven, 
we need to have at least one soul introduced to Christ. Amen? Amen. Who has introduced one soul to Christ yet? Have you introduced one soul to Christ? And really converted after Jesus? One, two, three. Only three? Now it means that we need to learn. Most of us. We cannot just leave Thailand without having one introduced to Jesus. We cannot leave Supanbury without introducing one to Jesus. Otherwise, we would be thinking of ourselves, am I really a real disciple? Because a real disciple is a soul winner. Our, our part is not to convert. It's the Holy Spirit. Our part is only to introduce. Just like what happened to the blind man. He was introduced by his friends out of their faith. They begged Jesus to really pray for him. Oh Lord, please accept him, heal him. And after this, this will be a series again on Wednesday and on Friday. And we'll piece the whole quarter together how are we are going to do discipleship. So winning a Samaritan, how did Jesus do that? How did Jesus do that? Now let us go farther in here. Have you experienced a, a, you know, a literature evangelist? Okay, brother, don't hold. Who else? Who else? Who else? Okay, a sister. Tessie. Tessie. All right. Now, if you haven't experienced what a literature evangelist is, maybe you have a different understanding that somebody knocking at your door. Uh, there's a salesman here coming. All right. And maybe if, who, who experienced being visited by a literature evangelist? One, two, three. I don't know what your experience, what is your perspective, because your perspective might be different from our perspective with, because we experience being a literature evangelist. Don't you know that before the literature evangelist comes to your house, your name is being prayed for, yes. right? It is more on kneeling rather than on selling. You might be thinking that, oh, here comes a salesman coming with books. Of course, we have to sell the books because the books will tell the people silently. The silent soul winner. The more sales, the more souls will read. But it is not just selling. It is business as mission. It is not just business per se. It is business because it's selling. Hard, not selling door to door. The hardest one ever. But it is business as mission. And there is one department in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But many don't know that it is business as mission. It is not business itself. I'm not talking about business this morning. I'm talking about here, witnessing, soul winning, how you do that. And one of the departments is this one. And when you understand this one, you will see that Jesus' approach is very much applicable to literature evangelists. Now, my audience here, those who are online, my audience here are not literature evangelists. I'm not speaking about literature ministry right now. I'm speaking about a principle that can be applied in literature ministry and be applied in disciples, it can be applied in business, it can be applied in any way else. And this is a wonderful approach. Believe me, if you experience literature ministry, it's a life-changing, personal development kind of experience. And I want my kids to experience that because I had three summers of that in, in, in Cebu, in, in Davao, actually first in Davao, in Cebu, and in Sambuanga. And it's so wonderful experience. It, it, it really changed my attitude. You learn how to handle objection. You learn how to be more prayerful. You learn how to set goals. You learn how to be positive. Like imagine you walk the whole day, right? And you don't have, and, and uh, your, our contribution was 10, 10 baht, 10 peso for food for the whole day. And if you don't have sales during the day, you may not have food for tomorrow. And so you have a goal, oh Lord, I need to approach 20 houses today. And I will not go home until I finish 20 houses. And in my experience, usually at the later part of the day, towards the goal of my number of houses approach, it is there that I got the order, with deposit, in or sales. And I said, oh, thank you. And it's a test of character, a test of faith, imagine. And I thank God so much for that. But this approach in literature ministry has much to do with how Jesus approached a Samaritan woman. How did he do that one? How did he do? What are the common excuses? I wanted to count all the excuses or objections. I didn't have count, I didn't have a chance to count all of them. How many excuses or objections did the woman have? 
from the beginning of this presentation to the end. And I want you to kind of take note of that. Now, they use this model called IDA, A-I-B-A model. It's a principle in interest, attention, interest, desire, action from Elias and Elmo Lewis in late 1880s. They use it in salesmanship, in advertisement, and it's used also in capacity work. Have you, have you tried this one? Were you given, you know, this kind of lecture before? Right? It is also applicable in this fellowship. Step one. All right, somebody would like to, to take a photo of that. Step one, actually it's attention. Step two, interest. It means you create attention, you create interest, you create desire, and then action. All right? It's the same thing also. Who, who else is it? I don't see any uh, single uh, gentleman here. How many are single ladies? Many. Yes. Huh? Let me see. All of them. Alright, all of you have how many? I want your hand. I want your hand. I wish the camera would be focused on them. One, two, three, four, five, six. If there is no gentleman here, would you rather use this approach to approach a man? You'll become a better now. Okay, this is not about that kind of nature, right? The principle is the same thing. Create attention. How do you create attention? I don't know. Maybe you use Facebook, Instagram, whatever that is. Interest, desire, and then action. Well, actually, you're going to study that one. It is not that simple. Because Jesus, in dealing with Samaritan woman, has a lot of experience besides this one. Now, let me introduce. Today, you're going to convert it into kind of an awareness also. Interest, desire, action. And today is 2020. You can use it online like articles, advertisement, webinars, Webinars paid, you know, um, search landing pages, web candidate, also applicable to any of them. Or white paper, you can either use it, not just offline, but also online. Correct? It's the same principle. It's the same principle that can be used today. But let me tell you the difference between selling and marketing. The first one is focus on product in yourself. In marketing, the focus is on the customer. You go down there, go down. Uh, selling is just focus on, 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 actually here, customer. is focus on, the customer is last. But in marketing, the focus is the customer. It means it's people. In selling, after selling, bye-bye. No more relationship. Jesus is not using that one. Jesus is using marketing. The difference between the two. You see, the principles of marketing is applicable in evangelism. And Jesus was using their relationship, not just selling a product and then goodbye, Samaritan woman. This is very important when we deal with, with uh, marketing today, as it is understood today, it is actually more on relationship. But I'm not talking about marketing again. I'm talking about Jesus' approach in this very hard prospect a Samaritan woman. And whether you like it or not, you are selling ideas in the classroom, correct? But the sales is not every day. The sales is at the end of the month. But then your relationship with students is not just during one day, every day. Therefore, it is not pure selling. It is actually marketing because you emphasis on relationship. But again, you don't make you know money in the classroom. You're selling their marketing ideas, right? Marketing principles, and at the end of the the result might not be by month, quarter, and later on when you see your students grow up, teacher, somebody come, somebody come. Thank you so much for teaching me. Now that is the result of the relationship, right? It's the same idea. They have changed their character. They have changed their mind. They become better students. They graduated and they're so thankful to you as the influencer, as the marketer, as the, as the soul winner. Do we see the same thinking in here? Wow. How do you approach a woman? I wish there were gentlemen here. And you just changed. No gentlemen here. There are a lot of ladies. Ladies, how do you approach a gentleman? I remember one time I was at the graduate school and uh, there were two Mongolians. And uh, they were so nice, you know. And, uh, uh, there were a lot of, of men in there, but uh, there were women, as usually, and even today. 
And so it came to a discussion like, uh, should a woman abuse a man? And I thought to the Mongolians, why not? It's biblical. <laughs> really? Wrongly, it's biblical? Did you read the Bible? It's biblical. Why not? You approach. You know, Ruth approached Boaz. Who approached? Who, who approached here? You see? It's biblical. Esther was approaching the king, right? Okay? Who was approaching the, the snake? He was the one approaching the snake. All right? Okay? <laughs> be careful when you be approaching. You might be approaching a snake or a gentleman. All right? I am warning you right now. Be careful who you'll be approaching. It shouldn't be a snake. It should be a handsome gentleman. Now, the principle stays there. And it's the same approach. The snake, the serpent, is using to approach Eve. And if you don't know who is approaching you, our enemy actually is using the same marketing. It's a battle of marketing between good and evil. If you don't know that marketing is wherever now is being used on Facebook and instead of anywhere else, on social media, on YouTube, we have been marketed many times by the enemy. Correct? And once you know this approach, you'll become more aware. Oh, 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 be careful. That is the marketing strategy of the enemy. Now it says you have a son, son too. I haven't met him yet, although I was in China one time, one year. He said if you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. No your enemy is the idea there. And how to know your enemy? You use Christ's method alone. Christ's method alone, if you read this one here, okay, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. In other words, there is only one method in reaching the people, and that is Christ's method. That's why he said in Matthew 4.19, Be my disciples, follow me. I will make you fishers of people because he has a method that nobody teaches. In here, the Savior mingled with men, mingling. One approach, one step. He showed sympathy for them, another approach. Ministered to their need, another approach. And when they're coming, then he bade them, follow me. Follow me. Actually, if you're going to summarize that, it could be like this. Contact or connection. Connection first. Connection first with the community here in Supanguri, in Singuri, in Antong, in Kansanaburi. Well, those who are watching online, uh, we will approach you. Okay? Let's be connected. You know? Let's be a front. If you are not connected yet, let's be connected now. If you are not uh, a believer yet, well, I'm not converting you. Just be, let's be connected with me. And uh, open-minded. You know? Uh, be open-minded. The things in here are really good. The important thing is we are connected. When we are connected, then there I can help you. All right? There I can show some concern. And, and then I can also show some compassion. Because he showed his sympathy and then he showed their commitment, actually care. He ministered to their needs. Care. People remember you because you care for them. All right? And then their confidence goes up. And it's time to, to tell them, follow me. That conversion should not be in there. It should be called. In our lecture later on about how we do discipleship, we will have what we call call or team calling. Every Sabbath afternoon, I am with your church. Before we go home, let's devote time at least two hours of team calling. But we, let us make sure that each one of them will go through all the process there from connection, concern, compassion, care, confidence, and then call. If that person is not going through all the five steps, it's so hard to call on the sixth step, which is call. All right? And uh, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary? It's scary to call on the ball? Yeah, because we don't know how to do it yet, and we are not used to doing it yet. And it's usually the one that evokes more rejection. You're like, 
Ah, and even put the uh, pastor, I don't like to do it, I don't like to do it, uh, it's, uh, I might be rejected. But before he makes such conclusion and prejudice, may I invite you to open your mind, how did Jesus again approach this Samaritan woman? And I want you to count how many objections she said, right? One thing in verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Jesus didn't say, didn't, Jesus didn't say that. Hi, beautiful. Am I handsome? Jesus didn't say that. Because he was not attracting the woman to himself, not to his beauty. In fact, Isaiah said that his beauty is not attractive, that men would not desire anything in his beauty. In other words, Jesus was not handsome from human eyes. He used something else. Ha, very demanding. Give me a drink. <laughs> if you were Jesus, if you were the woman, what? What's the usual? Hey, ladies, if the man would come to you like, give me a drink. What would you say? Oh, you're very demanding. Do I know you? Hello. Hello, do I know you? It's the same thing that some other woman said. So she said, you are a Jew. How can you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So she became interested. As we know the story, Jesus usually would normally would not pass by a Samaritan place, right? He would go the other way because Samaritans were not friends with the Jews. And if he would go to the Samaritan village, it would be useless, a waste of time, and there are more people who needed him than this Samaritan. But that day, <laughs> Jesus being God, he knew there is somebody. Somebody is going to listen to me. Somebody is going to fresh water. Somebody is going to be a very good prospect for God's kingdom. And she approached a woman. <laughs> Give me a drink. Oh, you're so demanding. Hey, Jew, you're so demanding. And so the woman became interested. And what's the next thing? Verse 9, verse 10. And so Jesus was creating a desire by saying, if you knew the gift of God and who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him using a third person, not me. You would have asked him and he would have given you, given you living water. Jesus didn't ask, hey, I'm the living water. He used a third person. It's a principle actually in relationship, in marketing, you know, even in here, in discipleship. You don't have any posture, you claim too much of yourself. Use the other person. Or use a third party. He was using a third party actually because there's nobody to edify him. John 3.30, John was edifying Jesus and he must increase and I must decrease. Someone will baptize you. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, before a very important person would come, someone would pave the way, would prepare the way. But who would prepare the way for Jesus? Nobody else. And so he introduced himself by saying, if you knew him, he didn't say me. If you knew him, okay, uh, you would have asked him. If you knew him, if you knew the gift of God who is asking you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It means... Before you are going to introduce yourself to the community, before you introduce the message, it means you have to do groundwork first. Does Sopanbury, do Sopanbury people know who the Seventh day Adventist people here in Sopanbury? Right? For example, me, I should be introduced first by, by, by the mission. But then we know it's other, so you don't know. It does mean. It's the same thing. We call it edification, but Jesus was creating a desire. Don't you know him? He didn't say, don't you know me? And what happened? Oh, the first objection of the woman. Woman, are you women? Are you good at objection? Yeah? Yes? I think I think they say yes, right? Gentlemen, are we good at creating objection? And I think women can relate to this one. They're very good at making them serve. <laughs> you have nothing to draw with, and the way 
well is deep, where then will you get this living water? First objection, right? I wanted to count the objections. And what did Jesus say? Hey, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock? Hey, mister, you are just so proud and demanding. You don't have anything to draw, and you want to tell that actually the, the woman, that the, somebody who understood that he was referring to himself, using a third person, that I can give you living water. And so the woman objected, didn't understand. All right? So Jesus now was trying to sell <laughs> the benefits, and he said, Everyone who drinks this water, this water from the well, will be thirsty. But whoever drinks the water, I, now he's using I, first person instead of third person, I will give him, he should be give her, will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him, he should have said, I will give you, will become in him a fount of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus was using the culture and the language in this time because at that time they used they would use indirect language. Ladies, would you like to be approached directly or indirectly? Directly. Huh? Who says directly? Ah, la, 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 let's have a, I wish the camera would be pointed at to the ladies now. Who says you like direct approach? Let me let, let me have your hand. Would you like a gentleman to approach it directly? One. A front. One, uh, okay. One, two, three, four, five. Directly now at your age. Okay? When you were 18 years old, 15 years old, how would you like to be approached? Indirectly or directly? I approach directly, Pastor. Directly is better than indirectly. Yes. Okay, okay. Directly now, now, now. The ladies are speaking. Pastor. They like to be approached <laughs> directly. I do not like indirect approach. Yes. Yeah. Ah, yes. I am a direct person. When I like someone and my wife knows that, I would just say, Hey, I will buy your motorbike. You go with me, right? <laughs> that is direct. <laughs> huh? <Yeah>. That is <laughs> why. That is why you prepare the situation like Jesus did. In the, the, the following, the, the previous verse, he prepared me as the living water. He was introducing, hey, he got the posture. He set the posture, hey, your water will not give you living water. My water is, it means he was setting the posture. No posture, no message. Your approach is zero. When you set the posture, the woman listens. Oh, really? Who is this? And he sells the benefit. Everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fount of water springing up to eternal life. Brothers and sisters, are you, are you shy to give people the benefits of our message? Yes or no? Yes or no? We are never to be shy. Why? We have the best water in the world. We have the living water introduced by the living God. There's nothing to be shy. Once Jesus already set the posture for us that we are 70 Adventist people, there's nothing to be shy because we have the best message, not just new start. We have the best message, not just the third, three angels' messages. We have the best God with a big God. We have the best product, living water that nobody can offer. And he was selling the benefits to the woman. And then the woman has the initial decision. The woman said, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. What would you do if you were Jesus? Oh, already this woman is accepting. But if you know ladies, as I have known ladies, don't count me how many ladies I have known. My wife, I would be in trouble. <laughs> how many ladies I have known. I should have a PhD in, in knowing ladies. The point is, I think you know ladies. You're on screen, people watching TV viewers, you know ladies. They say yes for the first time. The woman, the second one. But take note, 
That yes may be exactly the, 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 the final yes. Give me the water as if it is the, yeah, you're so happy. You're just, oh yeah, the woman accepted this water. But look, the next verse. And so Jesus, in, in, in the canvassing work, you will use a trial close, right? Because the person shows interest. Close, by the way. Close. Like, how much is it? Close. And Jesus said, Jesus used a trial close. Go call your husband and come back. All right? I don't know how you're going to apply it in a courtship because I'm not talking about courtship now. I don't know. But Jesus used a closing, a trial close, and call to action. But what did the woman say? The Samaritan woman said, Oh, ma, how did you know? Second, right? Second of Jesus, I have no husband. Jesus said, Call your husband. Jesus was very wise. I have no husband. It means instead of calling there, going right away, making an action, she made the second objection. I have no husband. Uh -huh. And what did Jesus say? Oh, yeah. And so if you are good, you acknowledge. Yes, do not argue. Do not argue. Hey, you have a five husband, do not argue. Jesus' approach is not to argue, acknowledge. You are correct. Okay? And give time to think, to process in her mind and her heart. Yeah, you are correct. You are correct to say that you have, have no husband. But then point out, <laughs> in fact, you have had five husbands. <laughs> and the man you now you have is not your husband. You have spoken truthfully. Jesus was acknowledging the truth, but then pointing out the truth also. All right? So, now, what is the woman's reaction? Convinced? Oh, is this the final convince? Be convinced? Maybe not yet. Verse 19. You still have many verses to go. All right? And here, sir, the woman said, I see that you're a prophet. Ah, oh, I'm going to sir. Grab it. I haven't met anybody like you. I'm going to go, going to go. So now, okay? Bili na ako, okay? <laughs> You'll be disappointed if you have that kind of thinking in soul winning, or even in canvassing, or even in courting, or even in marketing, or whatever that is, or even in your class, or whatever application. Because a woman has another objection, and number three, and he, she said, Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. She wanted to argue. Hey, women, are you good at arguing? Yes? Oh, all right. It's not for me. It's not for me. It's confirmed. They like to argue. Another objection, third time. Third time, third time. Oh, gentlemen, if you're listening here on screen, listen, <laughs> learn from this. You'll have a lot to learn. And next one, and what did Jesus say? Uh huh. You will use this approach in whatever form and situation. Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He did it. Argue, but instead give an assurance. Believe me, woman. Even in the first part here, verses, he didn't argue, he didn't answer the question. He didn't answer the question, he didn't argue, but again, here he just gave an assurance. Give an assurance. And then what did the woman say? You worship again, assurance. What you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. And what did the woman say? But the time is coming, but has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such as, as this to worship. Let me have a side bit here. Before COVID-19 comes, our worship was actual, like this, all right? And in fact, after a lockdown in Thailand, this is our first time here that we've met. We're meeting right now. And during 
you know, when the government of Thailand says, oh, you cannot have meeting. Virtual. virtual. We introduced the virtual meeting and there are a lot of opposition from some members. Oh, how can we worship pastors on our cell phone? This is not for worship. A lot of, 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 of objection. But look at here. What was said here? What did Jesus say? You worship what you do not know. You worship what we do know for time is religious, verse 23. A time is coming up, worship, what? True worshiper will worship in spirit. spirit and in truth. In other words, worship is not limited by a place. Even online, in here right now, you're watching me right now, we can have our worship. Not limited is of the mind. Worship is more of mind thing and heart. And so not limited by place. And so Jesus said here, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a sidetrack a bit of my emphasis, but it is very, very important. Those who are not with us here online, let me encourage you. We have a new normal this time. All right? And this world is never normal again. I'm not saying this is abnormal. I'm just saying this is new normal. Yeah. Everyone here is having this one. I'm not wearing now because I'm far from them. Everyone is using this tent. You can see the church right now. And everyone is using a combination of offline and online worship. And we have results on, on, online. And even organizations today have wonderful uh, they, they have this wonderful result like leaping uh, leaps and bouncing rapidly online in the discipleship evangelism growth of businesses growth of organizations growth of, of churches growth of baptism it is at this time of lockdown that the problem is not a problem it is an opportunity amen, amen. now is a new, a new opportunity it is easier now to approach the secondary people. Instead of knocking at the door where it's not possible from Monday through Friday, they are at their workplaces. Now it's possible to make friends with them. And knock at the door of our heart instead of the door of their houses. And that is the one, the principle that we can get out of in here. Next, another objection. Now what, what, what objection now? Number? Number four of Jesus, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. But when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Oh, oh. She was saying about his understanding. Oh, I said, she is all knowing, you know. I know that. I know that already. Oh, this is typical, right? When you tell some people, you invite them, I know that already. See, ladies, I'm not talking about courtship again, but it happened that a lot of ladies here. Hey, ladies. Would you like to say that? I know you already. All right? Actually, the gospel is too much to learn. There's a lot to learn about the gospel. There's a lot to learn about our God. Instead of saying, I know that already, learn. Learn. You can only, you only can have more if you learn more. That is the idea there. And Jesus used, Jesus was very wise. He used the affirmation approach. Jesus answered. I who speak to you am he. And then the woman, what did the woman do? Then the woman left her water a jar, went back to the town and said to the people, and said, oh, this is the man. You can read it. Look, who am I talking to? Is this the, the Christ? Right? In, in, in John uh, 4, 28, let me read it here. It says here, the woman that left her water pot then went her away into the city and said to the man, verse 29, Come see a man who told me all things that I've ever did. Could this be the Christ? After this objection, four objections, right? Four objections? Yes. Okay? Ladies, don't give a lot of objections. The one approaching you is not Jesus. <laughs> it's not Jesus. You might be late of train. Right? One objection is enough. Don't too much fucking put. Okay. 
the not three fourth. <laughs> what I'm talking about, if somebody approaches you with the gospel, do not be so pakipot. All right. So, right? <laughs> when Jesus approaches you, and a person approaches, no matter how handsome or or ugly he is, and you look, he's a man of God. Do not give him more objection. Listen, yes, yes, open yes. up your mind, brothers and sisters. This message has an eternal value. It could mean your eternal damnation or it could mean your e eternal salvation. I want you to open up your mind, listeners online, viewers. The one I went home, could this be? The Christ, he tells me everything I did. Ah, wonderful. Barna study shows that it takes an average of eight times exposure to the gospel before a person becomes converted. And even the organizations in the world today, they know this. And so they have to keep explaining, explaining at least an average of eight times. It is possible that when you're given a Bible study, that may not be your eighth encounter with the gospel. And you are not decided yet. It can be a song when somebody sings a song to you or a group of singers early in the morning during your birthday. Oh, what a wonderful, in my life, this is the first time to hear. It might be that you're introduced to, to a worship like this or you're introduced to a meeting. It might be that you were, you got an accident and somebody prayed for you at the hospital. It might be that that is your eighth encounter and then you decide to accept Jesus. Once you understand this one here, as a disciple maker, you will not be disappointed and you become like invincible. <laughs> I should not be affected with one rejection, second rejection, third rejection. Jesus received four rejections. But an average worldwide at least eight exposure to the gospel. Once you understand this one, rejection is nothing. All right? If you love yourself too much and you have a high ego, rejection is too much. But the good thing about being a servant of Jesus is you are not your own. It is Christ who lives in us. Objection is nothing because we are only stewards, servant. It's about Him, not about us. So when people reject us, actually they are not rejecting us. They are rejecting themselves of the message. Instead of giving them an opportunity for eternal salvation, for eternal life, they are rejecting themselves, closing themselves of that opportunity. I would really do not mind when people reject me. Hey, you are Seventh-day Adventists, and you believe this. I don't accept that. I don't mind that. I would just, I would just feel sorry for him or her. But personally, it doesn't mean anything to me. Because the right perspective is he is not rejecting me. He's rejecting himself. Closing himself of salvation. And I want you to listen if you're a televiewer online. Jesus is extending to the Samaritan woman a message of salvation which she accepted after four objections. If you don't know what we are talking about here yet, I suggest you keep learning not just today. See you on Wednesday night. On Friday night, I have this presentation. More about this study. That we are introducing to you a system of belief. At least 28 of them. And it takes some time to understand. And it's just basic. Once you go into advanced level, you understand that this is a wonderful belief system. That will improve your life. To live a better life. Not just on this earth. But in the world to come. Amen? Amen? I hope you understand this principle in here, which is an average worldwide. And so look, look, is it the end of the story? Is it the end of the story about the Samaritan woman? Not yet. Not yet. This is the fourth objection. And so here, the, the woman was witnessing. And, and, and she said, come see a man who told me every day, every day. could this be the Christ? She was witnessing. In other words, a converted person is witnessing. In other words, 
When you are a truly converted person, it's just easy or natural or normal for you to do witnessing. Who can easily do witnessing? I'm not telling that you are not converted. Otherwise, you, you don't want to see me again here to Tanbury anymore. Right? I'm just telling the fact, a fact that a true disciple like this woman is easy to do witnessing. Next, what's the result in verse 30? So they left the town and made their way toward Jesus. And then the whole town was converted. You don't need exactly the whole, how many of us? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Supanbury people to turn Supanbury upside down. How many are here? 15? Right? You need only one converted soul to turn upside down the whole village. But Supanbury is bigger than her village. We need a team work. All right? We need more converted one. And so I believe this message is giving us wonderful principles this morning. Applying Christ's method again. Before we can introduce someone to Jesus. Here. First, mingling or connection. Second, desire their good. Concern. Next, show sympathy. It means compassion. Next, minister to their needs. We have health ministry in here, right? We have English teaching, right? You can do English study. There are a lot of ways. And then, minister to their needs. That is not commitment. That is actually care. And then, you win their confidence. And then, it's time to tell them, come. Come Wednesday. Can we promise that we can call some people for Wednesday? And say... Hi, friend. We have a speaker on Wednesday. Are you available on Wednesday night? Yes or no? At 7. Uh, I'm not available. How about Friday? Oh, yeah, Friday. When he says Friday, he decides already. We have a speaker to talk about wonderful idea. You call it edification. Rolly is the name and he will be speaking about this topic. It can help you during this time of pandemic. Can you come? It will take only for him to speak about 30 minutes. Can you come? Ah, oh, I'm so busy. Okay, how about this short video? Uh-huh. And after watching this video, okay, I will come. Now we will make that kind of thing and make it professional. Because it's easier now to do that with a team calling. But before you introduce someone to Christ, connection first. Concern, like what he did to the servant woman. Compassion, and then care. Or commitment. Confidence, and then call. Conversion will just follow later on. I hope the simple message will give us principles that it is only Christ's method that will give us true success in reaching the people. It is not my method. What I'm introducing to the four churches in Singburi, Angtong, Sopanburi, and Kansanaburi is not my method. We do it quarterly, but this is Christ's method. And we will follow his method exactly what he did to the Samaritan woman, I believe, as what is penned, and this is what is correct. True success will come. Who among us believes that this method will work? Christ's method. Alright? Is it your desire to apply this method here in Sopanbury? Those who are in Anton, is it your desire to apply this in Anton? Those who are in Singbury, is it your desire to apply this in Singbury? Those in Kansanabri? Brothers and sisters, is it your desire to accept Christ's method and apply it in our discipleship and approaching people? Because actually we should be the best people in the world in approaching other people to Christ's kingdom because we have the best master, we have the best God, we have the best message. May God bless us as we ponder and apply this message for us, not just today, this morning, but even until he comes. God bless us. Amen.
For our closing song, let's all stand and let us sing, Work for the Night is Coming. Let us pray. Oh dear God, we thank you so much for the message. We are to work while it's still day, the night is coming. But no man can work. The night is coming, the clouds of heaven, this world will be covered with darkness after you leave this one. It will be a desolate place. But then you will take us, your servants, those saints that, that, you, that you have saved and will take with you in heaven. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us all. In Jesus' name, amen.